Hey, it's Norm from Tested.com. I'm here at CES, and we're behind closed doors with a meeting with Avagon. I got Alan Evans and Ed Tang here. Uh, you guys showed us an HMD last year that we thought was really interesting. It didn't use a display technology that we'd seen before, like not an LCD, not an OLED. And we want to recap, because you guys basically are almost ready to ship a product, and some of you guys might not know how this technology works. So tell me about the virtual retinal displays. Uh, what you do is when you see the world around you, you're seeing reflected light. And when you look far away, you're getting this reflected light off like the mountains. Or if we look out a window, you see reflected light from far away. And what we tried to do is we tried to recreate that light. We said, okay, how does that go into your eye? It's not like there's a picture or a screen where you're seeing a mountain from far away. And so we use mirrors and LEDs to create the light, shape it just like the light coming off that mountains, and then reflect in your eye where the only image formed is the one in your eye. And that's the same way we see the actual world. And it creates a really compelling digital video experience. So the, the analogy that we used last year when we talked about this was kind of like a rear projection TV, um, where instead of like LCD TV these days where every pixel may be illuminated or there's a backlight, um, you're shining a light through a mirror, a system of mirrors, but instead of like a rear projector TV or front projector TV where there's a screen, there is no screen. It's going right into your eyeballs. Yeah, so the screen is your retina. And what are the advantages of that? The advantage is it's very natural and your brain is this awesome image processing computer. And so when you send light into your brain, basically through your eyes, that matches what it's used to, all the functionality you've developed over 20 years of looking around gets used on that same image. And you don't get these conflicts of information that come when you get strange inputs that cause things like headaches or nausea after a while. It really reduces the fatigue and the difficulty for you to process that information. So it's low strain. Right? Yeah. I think the other really big advantage of it is the resolution is, seems so much higher than traditional panel displays. We have LCD and OLED displays have pixels and mm -hmm. subpixels of color. And also you have a lot of fill factor issues with a lot of non-active areas of a display. And when you look at a display like that, especially if it's large or magnified, you start seeing screen door effects or pixelation. Where this micro mirror displays like where we're using have such high fill factors, you simply can't see any pixelation. So even given the same input, video or image, the quality and resolution just looks better and sharper. Mm, you're, you're solving a problem as opposed to using a higher density source. You're just getting rid of the grids between the pixels. They, they blend together? Yeah, essentially the, 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 the space just doesn't exist, right? It's such a small gap between the mirrors and that we don't have subpixels of a color. We're showing every mirror is showing every single color. So you don't have these pixels that are split into smaller segments of color, which causes all these screen door and pixelation effects. So let's take a look at the engineering prototype. Yeah. I just put this on and, and ran through a couple of demos and this is already looks much improved than what we saw last year. Uh, what's changed since we saw this last year? So the difference here is this prototype was designed to prove out the technology. We moved to a single HDMI cable, which will run 2D and 3D. Doesn't require any other cables. All the electronics are embedded. There's three and a half hour battery life. And we've updated the optics to be both lighter and also be crystal clear from corner to corner. So last year, we, we hadn't nailed the edges yet. Here we have, but um, we also have done a lot of very, very interesting things to minimize power consumption and uh, facilitate a handshake with almost any device. So when you saw it, you saw it from a PlayStation, you saw it from a computer, from a phone. There's just a, a lot of things that we now support, which is fantastic. Let's show the people out there exactly what might be going on, because it's not like there is a screen here, you know, like a five-inch screen or six-inch screen like you see on the phone that some other HMD makers are using. It's being projected and bounced off from the side, from understanding. Is that how it works? Or Right. So actually, in front of your eye here, there's a chip with two million, actually, there's one million micro mirrors per eye. So you have these millions of micro mirrors right in front of your eye, and off to the side, we have a low-powered LED generating the, the different colors of light, mm -hmm. and where patented optics are shaping that light to that really comfortable, natural light that Alan was talking about. Once we have that quality of light, we bounce it off of those millions of micro-mirrors directly into your eye. So you, the, you have the quote-unquote input resolution that's only limited by the size of the micro-mirror array, right? And yep. so right now, a million micro-mirrors, that's equivalent of about 720p Correct. Yep. So we each have eye? 720p for each eye. And of course, the, the technology is very mature. We can scale that resolution larger as needed down the road. So if your supplier, whoever's making the micro mirrors, if they have a higher density or a larger one later on, we could foresee maybe a higher input resolutions? But, uh, the, part of it is they already do. The issue is the pipes. Mm, uh, okay. The HDMI standard is uh, 720p at 60 frames per second. Right. So 
once the whole ecosystem exists. So once you're HDMI 2.0, then you can do 1080, 60, you know, no problem with two images. Then, then that's that's when you'll be ready for that. Yeah, and like we said before, the our the, the chip supplier that we use already have 2K chips, 4K mm -hmm. chips. They all okay. exist. Yep. The, really, it's the optics that you guys have, have locked down. <laughs> something wearable. Can you describe the image? So when I put this on, it looks like a floating image in front of me, and it's a very sharp edge to edge, like a box around this image. It's not full field of view. It is kind of like a floating TV in front of you. Uh, but even watching a 720p input, like like the um, like I was watching a movie, 3D movie, you know, the text looks sharp and the edges look sharp. How are you designing the optics? What are your plans going forward for the optics? For maybe fill, filling up more field of view, or have you reached a sweet spot? For a product like this, for MediaWare, you can't go bigger than about 40 degree field of view because if you show the same image to both eyes, you'll see double vision. At about 40 degrees, you fuse them, you go, oh man, that looks great. And that really allows the plug and play functionality with all these devices and all the content that currently exists. At the same time, you know, we are always looking at other applications and other optics specific to those other applications. So, you know, yesterday you saw something that was a little wider field of view, which is in the FPV space where that more engaging, you know, really pulls you in, but we have more control over the video chain. So there's specific things we can do there. Why well, here we really want to create a consumer device that looks good, but you can't just look good, you can't just have good video, you have to have the experience so that it's easy to plug in, easy to use, you know, the whole consumer experience has to be seamless. And I mean, so this is a sweet spot for that seamless Right, experience. I mean ultimately we're designing this to be, I guess I would call it the premium mobile uh, media device, mm. right? Where all the content you, that you love and own today, all the devices that you have today, you know, you're streaming video from Netflix or YouTube, or if you're in China, you're using Yoku and Aichi. It's going to plug right into your device. You're going to press a button. It's just going to work. And it feels like you're sitting right in the middle of a fantastic movie theater. And that's what the content is optimized for. That's what our device is optimized for. Just a really fantastic media experience. Yeah. Media consumption, your t standard HDMI, feed any device you want to plug in. And I do want to mention, like, you guys are experimenting with different types of field of views for different applications. I think the FPV multi rotor flying community was pretty excited to see what you can, what you, how you can fly FPV with a device like this. So that, that was really interesting. So the consumer product, and that's something you're showing off at CES now. So t talk about the ergonomics of this and what makes good ergonomics for an HMD. Hard work makes good ergonomics <laughs> for an HMD. What we've done here is we've taken all the elements of the engineering prototype and the industrial design and our ergonomic studies. And what you see is uh, compression, versus how much pressure do you have wear on the nose, which is very different for different sets of glasses, where is the optical alignment, and then how much does it weigh. And so we've really attacked all of those problems down to simulating the springs that we're using in the headband to get the right tension from mm -hmm. the 5% female width head to the 95% uh, widest male head. You know, we've looked at how the telescoping occurs along with that to be sure, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. this is a right. just, to be sure that it will match what is necessary to get the right clamping force to not cause too much pressure or too little pressure. And then we've even looked at the ear pad leather materials in different spaces there to be sure that it is comfortable with the skin, but also provides the right amount of friction to offload some of the vertical weight based on the compression. So we've really, we've spent a lot of time looking into it down to, um, we're looking at doing interchangeable nose pieces, almost like the earbud plastics to be sure that any variants there are easily taken care your of. Your points everybody. of contact, basically, it's a clamp design, so yep. you're confident that you don't need a overhead strap, um, and then the nose bridge is where it's resting on, right? Yeah, and to the overhead strap, one of the questions we get all the time is why no overhead strap? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's an optional accessory. We're actually putting in clips for it because we have a head tracker, Got it. and if you, you're in Call of Duty and you're whipping your head all over for four hours, maybe you want a strap. And the other thing that is always funny is people talk about when they flip it up, you know, making the lenses dirty. And obviously, they're uh, Gorilla Glass, and then we have lens covers. Got it. So both. So you those. want to make it look like spare headphones. You yeah. can flip it up and wear it like headphones. Yeah. Um, and then for the optics here, um, you can adjust IPD, um, distance between the pupils, and also focus. Yep. So we're adjusting IPD on here. These are pressed down lock mechanisms. So you just push it down, slide it, let go, and it will self-lock. That way, you don't have it drift around, which can cause problems. And then here, these are actually in quite a ways here, but they rotate. And mm -hmm. we're looking at different ways of clock faces so you can have visual memory. And that was a trade-off to prevent basically extra mechanisms from adding weight for a device that's owned. So you might be like, oh, I have to adjust it, but you have to adjust it exactly once. 
Got so it. that's part of that is us. Um, will will be on us to figure out how to make that setup a really awesome experience. So how far were you guys from production and fulfilling the Kickstarter backers, for example? Well, the great thing is uh, we have a lot of we have a great team with a lot of manufacturing experience. So we feel really comfortable about where we are right now with our manufacturing process. You know, we're already engaged with our manufacturer. We're already starting a lot of the first batches uh, and testing out of our manufacturing line. Uh, we expect to have functioning prototypes that look like that within the next month or two coming off the manufacturing line. So we're really excited about that. We expect to be shipping our first uh, products to our backers, our Kickstarter backers, and then our pre-order backers uh, this, sometime this fall. So we expect uh, to ship out our first five to 10,000 units uh, probably around uh, by the end of the year and then start uh, trying to get this in the hands of more consumers. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys, for showing me the new design for your glyph. That's what you guys are calling it. Yeah. And uh, talking about the display technologies, which we're pretty excited about. Yeah, no, and appreciate you coming by. It's, it's cool. We're excited. Awesome. Uh, we'll have more stuff from CES 2015 this year on Tesla.com. I'm Norm, and I'll see you guys next time.